we worked for many years with students and interns at the ICD and incoming guests because we also have international students with us. And a month ago, we thought we should use more their academic potential and do something like professional development. So once a week, we come together and talk and make plans what else we could do to make use of the city or introduce institutions that our international interns and students haven't heard of. And then we thought, hmm, could be better not only to talk about institutions, but to invite representatives of institutions to get a chance to see them in three dimensions and get a chance to ask questions. And that was also at a time when my students from an international relations program were discussing products from the German Marshall Fund, like transatlantic trends, and we looked at surveys and publications, and that brought up a similar idea that it would be good to get in touch with GMF, also for life after studying in Berlin, to apply for internships and so on. So um, I managed to talk to Heike McCarran, whether it's possible to get her here, also to introduce the new building of the ICD, and talk about how does one become what she's currently doing, what is the German Marshall Fund doing, and also if we still find time for that, to look a bit at the content of the work of the German Marshall Fund. That's the background of why we are meeting at this occasion here. And in the tradition of the ICD, for those of you who have been here earlier, we always have a formal introduction of the speaker, which I'm very happy that today will be presented by a volunteer from your group. And here he is. Hello, I'm Daniel, and it is my honor to present uh, Heike McCurran. She is the director of German Marshall Funds of the United States Berlin office, and she works closely with GMF's president and vice president on overall strategic development of, for the organization. McCarran first joined GMF in 1993 as a program officer responsible for research support programs for German academics and the study tour program for grantees in East Germany. More recently, she served as director of Berlin office and has program officer for the Immigration and Integration Program. Before coming to GMF, McCarran worked as a marketing specialist for the European Office of Nich Nichiman Company and the Western Company State Bank in Dusseldorf. And she was officer manager of the European Office of U1 Construction Company. She is a member of the German Council on Foreign Relations and the new trans trans traditions network for the US Embassy in Berlin. She is also an advisory board member of the Council on Public Policy in Beirut, the US ABLE project of the Kerber Foundation in Hamburg and partner through Berlin. McKellen received a master's in American studies, sociology and journalism from the University of Berlin and simultaneously worked as a researcher for German Science Foundation project on educational and political challenges of integration of Turkish school children in Berlin. She speaks fluent English and French in addition to her native German. Right. Thank you very much for coming. The floor is May yours. I stay here? If you would okay, please. thank I you. I think it's more. <laughs> I would like to stay here for two reasons, exactly as you mentioned. Is, is, can you he all hear me? Okay, I move over a little bit. So thank you so much for this ki very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. It doesn't happen to me every day that uh, uh, I'm uh, introduced in this very kind and thoughtful way. So thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Uli, for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and to talk to you all. I am not prepared to give a keynote lecture. Um, because I, I also think, I don't believe in keynote lectures. That's what you do at university, that's what I did at university, and that's also not the philosophy of the German Marshall Fund. So these are my reasons. So um, I'm German, and as you maybe talk a little bit about myself, as you heard in the introduction, I'm not a classical international relations specialist. I'm not, I have not studied at Harvard, I don't have a PhD. I'm a woman, I don't know what else speaks against me, but several things do 
speak against me sort of when you look at my career from purely German foundation, executive, academic perspective. And that's probably also the reason why I ended up with an American organization. When I started at GMF in 1993, having a master's from Free University Berlin, which is not exactly an Ivy League institution. Sorry about that. No, it is <laughs> it's getting there. I know it's changing. It is, yes, I know, I know. But at the time, it was not. Sure. Um, and um, you know, having this funny background, having worked in a bank and, and for some Japanese and Korean companies and done this and that and the other thing, the, the German Marshall Fund gave me an opportunity. And the German Marshall Fund gave me an opportunity that I felt was too good to pass because it had to do with my personal interest, uh, the United States, transatlantic relations, working in an international environment that, and, and all that. And very typically for the time, I hope that has changed too now, the first letters, uh, your colleague mentioned that I um, managed research grants for German academics to do research on transatlantic relations, United States and so forth, characteristically, from the start on, I got letters from German professors, German academics, and you put it that way, saying, Professor Dr. McCarran. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I'm not a professor, Dr. Slowly that changed, and slowly I became self confident, understood, you know, it's not, the Americans never asked for this. So they said, let's give her a chance and do it. And so, you know, I'm grateful that I was given this opportunity. I'm also grateful that I could work, that I was given the opportunity to particularly work at this institution, the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And I, I'm pretty sure you have never heard of the German Marshall Fund, so let me just mention very briefly what, what this is. It is an institution that was created in 1972 under the government of Willy Brandt. And it was created as a special, uh, special signal of gratitude of Germany for the Marshall Plan aid. You know, Germany, those of you who study history will know that um, you know, Germany was the former en enemy of the United States. Germany was divided and there were plans, there were discussions in the United States and elsewhere. Um, you know, what do we do with this defeated country? We don't want them to rise. And there was things like the Morgenthau plan. Anyway, the United States changed their mind and very generously um, included Germany in the European Reconstruction Plan. That is the official name of the, of the so-called Marshall Plan. It's called Marshall because George Marshall announced it uh, at Harvard University. So... Um, uh, 25 years later, in 1972, uh, Harvard, the Harvard University invited then Chancellor Willy Brandt to um, speak at, uh, at a, give a commencement speech, I, I think it's called. Um, and then Germany and German pol policymakers thought, you know, this is so special for us. This is so special that Willy Brandt is invited on the exact same day. 25 years later as when George Marshall gave his famous speech and announced the Marshall Plan and announced the inclusion of Germany, that Germany conceived, thought, we want to give something back. And that is the origin of the German Marshall Fund. It's a gift, a monetary gift to the United States with a speech really brought, that Billy Brandt gave as our mission statement, basically. And the, the mission statement reads the same as it did today. Uh, our organization is supposed to um, support transatlantic relations in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. So that's on one hand a very broad statement, on the other hand a very narrow statement. It's broad because it just talks about the spirit of the Marshall Plan that's open to interpretation. It's very narrow because in today's world, I mean today's globalized world is much more than transatlantic relations. And I will come back to that. Correct, characteristically, and you see I'm talking about this from a German perspective, I'm sure my American colleagues would talk about this very differently, but from my perspective it was correct, characteristically American that the Americans chose to create a private independent NGO, if you will, and not some government arm, um, you know, I, I, other governments I think may have thought, oh, you know, let's have this money administered by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, by the State Department, put it in some pot for scholarships or, or things like that. I, I think the fact that uh, uh, 
America and the leaders at the time described, uh, decided to create an independent institution says something about, first of all, the appreciation uh, of the United States for this gift, but also of um, about sort of the civil, the, the idea that civil, this should be a civil society institution with an independent board. The board is entirely American, had offices in Washington, but not some kind of government arm. Um, yeah, and the rest is history, I could say. By the way, I also want you to ask questions and interrupt and do whatever you want. If you if you like this, to, I would very much like this like this to be a dialogue more than than a speech. Um, and if I go on and on, just you know, frown and show me that you're bored, please. Um, are we prepared for this in terms of having a microphone in case someone has oh a yeah, question I didn't think about since that. we are recording? Because that would be helpful. Thank you, but okay. that was not okay. for the sake of interrupting Yeah, yeah no, very good. Um, okay, so um, we started out doing our programs, our board at the time, this was even, I, although I have been with the German Marshall Fund for more than 20 years now, this was before my time as well, the board said, so what do we do with this, what do we do? We started out with uh, exchange programs for uh, scholars, European, we supported European studies in the United States, we supported um, uh, academic research about the United States transatlantic relations in Germany and so forth, but our the mission that Willy Brandt gave us in 1972 was European. It was not German. That's sort of, I think that's also very, was very special at the time and not, to, not, I don't know, not necessary is the wrong word. Not, one shouldn't take it for granted. In 1972, you will remember the world was divided. There was East and West. And Willy Brandt in his speech explicitly said Europe, all of Europe and not just Western Europe or Germany or anything. So that was the vision right, built right into the mission statement, which was great for us for the, from a programmatic point of view because it allowed us to you know, work in other countries as well, not only Germany, but it also, also, I personally think, you can see I'm a great fan of Willy Brandt, you can see that it was very far-sighted. Far I mean, I, I'm not trying to suggest here that Willy Brandt sort of envisioned that the wall would fall eventually and that Europe would be united and all that. But he certainly didn't give up the dream, which many people in the West and in my generation, in particular in West Germany, did at this time, thinking, you know what, this will never happen, you know, this is so cemented, this East-West conflict with atomic weapons on both sides and so forth. That many people didn't believe in, the, in this dream. Um, so what do we, we, I said we have a board that's made up of Americans, we have our headquarters in Washington, just to give you a little bit of an, an idea about the organization, and we have a president that's based in Washington, um, and we have seven offices in Europe, the oldest one being in Germany, first in Bonn, the former capital, then we moved to Berlin, we have an office in Brussels, in Paris, and I need to look at my paper because we have so many. Uh, Brussels, Paris, Berlin, Bucharest, Ankara, Belgrade, Bratislava, Stockholm, and Turin. We are proud to call ourselves the American organization with the greatest, the American private NGO, I should say, with the greatest presence in Europe. Um, and we are, it helps us a great deal because we have, except in Brussels, and I will tell you why in a minute, we employ what the Americans call local nationals like me, like Germans in Germany and French in France and so forth in, in our offices. In Brussels, the Brussels office director is an American and why? Maybe, it's, maybe you have the answer? No, okay, <laughs> please. Okay. That's absolutely right, that's absolutely right. The European Union, 28 countries, we are an American organization that supports American-European relations. We figured um, putting whatever nation, nationality there in Brussels will send a signal that will be interpreted in so many ways, so we better put an American there. Um, and I think this was the right decision. 
So what do we do all day long? Um, we try to, we, we, on, let me start sort of with a macro level. Transatlantic relations in the past 30 years you know, have gone up and down, go in waves, up and down. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. They're more often bad than good, although, you know, in the big picture, they're okay. But they're, they're, they're characterized by crisis. For example, let me start just as a, as a um, I don't know, uh, arbitrary date. In 1982, we had a crisis around the Pershing, the, the NATO double track decision. This caused demonstration in Europe. You know, the German Marshall Fund looked at that and said, oh, what do we do? We, we, we felt there's a lot of misunderstanding around the purpose of this and what the Americans are trying to achieve with this. And so we started a fellowship program. You know, we look at these things, and I'm using that example because we look at these things. I mean, we cannot, we cannot shape policy. We shouldn't be, you know, grand, grander. We shouldn't present ourselves as grander as, than we are. But we can try to do, do sort of things similar, I guess, what the, to what the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy tries to do, formulate some projects that maybe help increase understanding, open up new ways, enable people to have some new insights, see things in a slightly different perspective by talking to each other in person, by going to the other continent and trying to understand that perspective. And it's very important, and I think most independent organizations would do it that way, that we don't do it uh, like the government, that we do not try to present you know, a, a, a picture that's brighter than it actually is. So I think that's important in any international program, but I think when it comes to sort of crisis moments in, in, in international relations, it's particularly important. So what does this mean? It means, let's say we bring a group of Europeans to the United States, we don't only show them, introduce them to Washington establishment, we show them soup kitchens in New York, we show them protest movement. We try to show a full picture of the United States and of course of Europe when we, Amer when we bring Americans here. Um, the crisis go on and in a way we have, we have followed crisis moments by trying to think of ways, you know, how we can contribute to, to fix them. The latest moment came in, uh, oh no, not the latest, the latest is now actually. <laughs> a big crisis moment was ar around the Iraq, Iraq war after 9-11, when uh, the Schroeder government took a stand against the American government and uh, Joshka Fischer said in Munich, I don't know who heard that, you know, I don't believe, what did he say exactly? I don't believe, I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced of your argu arguments. This was directed at, at, uh, uh, at Secretary power. Rumsfeld. And the Germans had big demonstrations and the, they were totally behind their government on that decision. And this looked, at the same time in the United States, you had a completely different um, mood you had sort of, you know, the shock of 9-11 on the one level. You had, remember, the home, Department of Homeland Security was created. Um, um, people rallied against a strong president or a perceived strong president, depending on how you <laughs> personally think about George Bush. And um, at the same time, and the elites in Washington, I remember that well because I went there, um, you know, we're talking about this is the moment where America really has to be strong. And there was, you hear of the neocon movement, remember that? There was a whole movement in Washington, probably not in the rest of the United States, by the think tank, by the foreign policy, that talked about now it's time to get serious about democracy promotion. This shall never happen again. Now we will think of ways uh, to make the world safe for democracy, to put it mildly. That led to papers that were called Turkey as the model of the democratization of the middle, greater, middle, greater Middle East, of course, not just Middle East. And, you know, I can, there's paper, there's, this led to papers, one was very famous, became very famous by Robert Kagan. It was called the, the Venus and Mars, and he described the Americans as Martian and the Europeans as Venusian, whatever, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't think of the word, but basically building an argument around the fact that, and I'm caricaturizing a very smart paper now, yes, but I will do it, um, 
the, the Europeans being cowards. You know, the Europeans always give in. Um, the Europeans are so, um, had so much war that they're sick of it. They will never be our allies in our efforts, in our military efforts, in our democracy promotion. I mean, this was a very tough time. And so we sat there and said, what? I, got, I got all these calls from journalists, which I usually never get, um, but uh, all of a sudden uh, I got all these calls. So what are you doing now? What is the German model supposed to do fixed transatlantic relations? What are you doing now? And I, well, not all that much. We did try some track to diplomacy projects by sending people from the chancery for confidential talks to Washington and vice versa didn't help all that much. So that's what I mean when I say we've got to be modest about what, what we as an organization can achieve in this field. Um, the next crisis, uh, just, and I want to end here and really sort of have a conversation with you. The, the next, there, there were several crises in between, but the next big crisis um, originated with the NSA affair um, and the perceived breach of trust that Germans felt when it came out. Uh, um, through the Snowden leaks that the NSA has had, you know, listened to all sorts of things, including uh, Angela Merkel, the chancellor's cell phone. Um, and um, some of it, while some of it was media hype, but that it also showed some deep-seated disappointment that what Germans perceived as their ally and friend, who were, despite all the difficulties they had supported in many ways, felt Germans felt betrayed by that. Now, we're talking about Secret Service stuff here. So, I don't know, you know, how much of it is true. I don't know what really happened. I don't know, you know, whether the German intelligence cooperated in this, which is very well possible. Um, but you know how these things go. These things are blown up by the media, and then there was general disappointment with the Obama administration. Anyway, Obama didn't turn out what Germans thought he would turn out. I don't know what they thought, but anyway. Um, and so that then spills over into other policy areas. The, the big transatlantic project now is the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement, TTIP, Transatlantic Transatlantic Trade and Investment Trade, Partnership. Thank you, Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, and we don't know yet how that will, play. It's, it's, it's a big transatlantic project. And I'm not saying, you know, it is good, I don't know what it is, it's not, it's not finished, but it's a project that can help both our economies, United States and Europe, um, to grow and prosper and do it together instead of fighting each other for markets and for, for goods across the Atlantic. So we will, we will have to see how that goes, um, but it's very controversial here. Um, I, in the United States, a little bit less so, but that may still come. Um, and personally, in my personal assessment, I, I feel that if we don't come to an agreement or to a bad agreement, this will send a very strong negative signal um, about the future of the relationship uh, for the generations to come. So, so much for me for an introduction, maybe. Um, I heard you are also interested in internships. I brought some, it, maybe you could you just ask me what you're interested in? I, I will try to make this, um, you know, for, it's for you, it's not for me. <laughs> That's the plan, and that's also how I introduced it. First of all, thank you very much for the introduction. And as I said in the beginning, we could, of course, entertain you in having a conversation on stage, but this is not like television. This is meant to be it more... It just looks like television. It looks <laughs> like television, and we record it. But there is already a question in the back. And since we don't all know each other, because that's also about a, a group-building thing, and some of us even get grades for participation, they are very much invited to say something, but there was a question in the back. A uh, very good evening. This is Manas Tiwari. I'm a student here in MA Global Governance and Cultural Diplomacy. What kind of internship in developmental sector are you offering? Do you have anything in developmental sector? Like because nowadays in globalization, PPP is going on public-private partnership. 
Thank you. I didn't understand. I also question. didn't get the I'm full sorry. question. What kind of developmental internships are you offering? Are you offering what any kind of, kind of internships? Of are you offering? Oh, what yeah. internships? Yeah. 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 Sorry, here in Berlin, you mean? Um, we inter we we offer German Marshall Fund offers internship in all its offices, in all the offices that I mentioned, starting in Washington. Berlin, Brussels, and they're always they're posted on our website. Here in Berlin, we are currently offering two, one internship uh, that's unpaid, I have to say, um, and one trainee position that's for one year. It's a mix of admin, which is paid. Not, it's not a great salary, but it's a decent salary. And these are the two positions we have now. Our internships are constantly published on our website. We have to introduce a few changes because uh, I don't know if you heard, but Germany introduced the minimum wage law or int will introduce on January 1st. So that affects our, you know, we need to be more careful and we need to pay some of these things, which is good for the interns. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's something then we have to explain to Washington and say, hey, what? What is this? Because in, in the United States, it's still for free. Um, I was wondering how is uh, this entity founded, actually? Where do you get your money from? The, Where are you? the German Marshall right Fund. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah the uh, um, my name is Maria. I'm a student here, Globalization and Cultural Diplomacy Masters. Oh, thank you. Um, the organization was founded with a gift from Germany to the United States in the form of 150 million German marks. At the time, we didn't have the euro. Remember, we had the marks. That was under, then it was renewed uh, in 1987 under the chancellorship of Helmut Kohl, who gave another 100 million marks. Then it was renewed again and again with smaller amounts. Is it and as an endowment and yes, you work the, on the benefits from the endowment or is it money that you can use for projects? We created an endowment of which we take out a certain spend out rate okay. each year and use it for project. But it was created as an endowment. And again, that was something Willy Brandt said. The German, the, the Marshall, the gift that was meant as a permanent memorial to the Marshall Plan. And that's why, uh, you know, these, the fathers of the, or mothers of the German Marshall Fund felt it's, we should create an endowment. But we also work with partners. We have uh, many projects. Uh, for which we um, have been fundraising um, across the board from foundations, from other governments. So our budget is now much larger than just the spend out rate. But the origin is, is, from, is this German money, yes. Um, and I was also wondering from an administrative point of view if it's centralized or decentralized. Excuse How do you me? work? Is it centralized or decentralized the way you work? I'm not sure I understand. I can I could interrupt. I, I don't know I, in what way centralized or decentralized. You mean all How much flexibility do you have in, in Berlin? Huh? Can you develop your own programs or how much independence do you have? It's a mix of things. It's a, our as I said, our board is the you know, they take the big decisions. The, what's the budget for next year? Um, which programs should we keep, which programs should we maybe not keep. This, these big decisions are all taken by the board. However, related to the fact that the German Marsh Fund is pride to hire local nationals is the fact that they actually empower them to a certain degree. I mean, I cannot just invent a project and then tap into the money. No, I have, but I can create a project because I think this is important for Ger my job is German-American relations. You know, my Paris colleague develops French-American or often multilateral. Most of our projects are multilateral across Europe. I so said, we should do this project. When somebody says, hmm, yeah, write it up. I write it up. Then somebody says, well, present it to the, your colleagues. I present it to my colleagues. Then, have, then come, you know, ton, the, the colleagues are always the toughest critics. They come tons of questions and things. And then ultimately, some, the president takes it. Do we take this to the board of trustees and ask the board to finance it? Or how do we want to finance it? So this is about how this works. But we all have the opportunity to um, create projects. I mean, this is famous um, Americans like to call this policy entrepreneurship, I never knew how to translate this into German, but it's, um, the idea is you know, that we're all experts who know our field and um, can do something. I think Sam had a question a while ago. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Sam Madvig and I'm a member of Herr Bruckner's class. Um, I just wanted to first off say thank you very much for taking the time 
to speak with us this evening. Um, but my question had to do with TTIP um, and what you had said very at, uh, at the very end of your statement about how if we weren't to figure out a, a, a sort of like partnership in TTIP, like an actual agreement, it would be very bad for the like relationship between the two parties. But I wasn't sure whether you thought it would be bad for the relationship just between the United States and Germany or between the United States and the entire European Union. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I mean, as you know, TTIP is not with Germany, TTIP is between the EU and the United States. And when I say transatlantic relations, most of the time I mean Europe and the United States. I'm working on a particular aspect of this, but generally um, transatlantic now relations nowadays are more about the uh, European-American relationship than the bilateral. But that's exactly also the tension, right? And then, you know, you remember Kissinger saying the famous words, or, you know, who do I call in Europe when I want to talk to Europe? Who do I call? I mean, we still haven't solved that. Um, there is Brussels, but there are still the member states. Germany now is more powerful and all that. So that's sort of the preamble. Um, The reason why I'm not optimistic is uh, about, you know, what happens if TTIP fails is that unless one, what, what, or, let me ask the question to you. What is the big transatlantic glue that holds us together these days? Is it NATO still? You know, what is it? Um, you know, I don't take the pivot, the so-called pivot to Asia as you know, an ultimate pivot so that the United States will never, you know, talk to Europe again. But it is there. And we shouldn't kid ourselves, Europe, and particularly Germany as an export, also looks to China. So we're both looking to China and we're both looking to Asia. You know, we see the new markets there. We see power shifts taking place. Um, and I think a big factor in all this is also demographics uh, with Europe aging with America shifting in demographic composition. So I, I guess my statement has more to do sort of with the trends I observe, some of which have to do with, with the interrelationship, but some of also the global trends. I don't know if you share this. <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> but if we talk about the glue, is it really the institutional arrangements that matter here so far, or is it what we describe as the Western world, that we believe in similar principles and values and ideals, like universal values, which are not seen in a relativist manner, a certain, not a certain, but a general understanding of what we think democracy is. I don't think there's any political system on this planet which is not pretending to be a democratic one, including North Korea, but our interpretation is kind of a shared Western one. Plus, it's all a market economy. So if there are shared values, then I think we don't need necessarily a specific institutional arrangement as a substitute for a glue. If we don't have a common denominator, then institutions won't work. Um, there are certainly truth in what you say, and I think that historically you're absolutely right. Um, I see indicators for, for both. I see indicators for common values that still exist, and that, but that, that we tend to forget, that we either take for granted and forget because of that, or um, that we, there are actually also values that we don't share, and that is part of the problem. I mean, we, ha we do have these discussions about you know, the death penalty in the United States, for example, and there are many Europeans who say, oh, the Americans don't share our values anymore. How, you know, how can they? Um, the values debate came out in this, in this debate around the Iraq war very strongly, this Venus and Mars thing. And the interesting thing is, I think, it comes out, they come again, and it's when there's a crisis. The cri sometimes the crisis reveals that we do have, still have common values or make people appreciate them more, let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. For example, now uh, the crisis around Russia and Ukraine. I don't know how this will play out. I think, I personally think um, 
it's not clear yet whether you, United States and Europe will go together. And whether we, there are many Germans, if you read the paper, who argue, you know, you talk about equidistance between Russia and uh, the United States and that, so I'm not sure that the glue, that the values argument is, I think we need more than these common values. Mm -hmm. Which is probably part of the values, because if we are committed to pluralism and tell others that a pluralist society is in our best interest, not only ours, but also theirs, then freedom is the freedom of the other. And it's perfectly what we want, that not everyone is streamlined and believes in the same thing, but we have this democratic discourse based on conflicting opinions, but we have a civilized way of dealing with it. But I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Other questions? Hi, I'm Danny. I work here at the ICD. At the back. Yeah, the um, back. I'm, my question follows on from the last two that were talked about, so the TTIP and the governance of your organization. Um, so coming from Britain, I hear the British perspective of the TTIP deal. I acknowledge that the benefits for Europe as in, in general are good, increasing competitiveness and productivity, but there's the fear in the UK that by agreeing to this agreement, it, ri it risks our public services, and it, especially in the UK, the NHS. If we agree to the deal, it will let US uh, companies come in and battle competitively against the public sector to run those hospitals, which might have an effect on us paying for healthcare in the future, like they have in, a, in the USA. How do you, as an organization, um, balance up national interest against your non-governmental stance? So, uh, so you're here, you have a position. I didn't hear if you had a position in the UK, but um, how do you kind of balance those two things together, and what, who ends, how do you end up making a decision about it? Okay. Well, I have to admit, I understood uh, one, only one part of what you said, and that was sort of how do we balance it? national interest versus oh. our... Oh, okay. Do you want me to repeat the main point then, quickly? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so the TTI, T TTIP yeah. agreement risks the public health service in the UK, that's a big concern for British citizens. Um, Public health services in the UK. Yeah, the NHS. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, it risks US companies coming in and competing for hospitals in the UK, which at the moment are yeah. public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so my question was, how do you as an organization, being an, a non-governmental organization, how do you uh, weigh up the national interests of specific countries in the EU, EU compared to the whole EU vision as a whole? Because I do appreciate that there are gains to be made as Europe as a whole from the, uh, from the TTIP agreement, but there are obviously national problems within Europe that were a subject. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do, we, the simple answer is we do not get involved at that level. I mean, we are not the negotiators, right? We provide analysis. One thing that we do is we publish papers in the United States and Europe, for example, we just published a paper in English in the United States talking about German concerns and views and polls and doing events in Washington and elsewhere to explain this to the Americans. We do the same here. We do not, when something is negotiated, something like this is negotiated, the German Marshall Fund does not make specific policy recommendations. One of them. This is not our, I mean, this is for the policymakers. We are not elected, right? Uh, we don't have the legitimacy. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but we sort of stay uh, one step removed from, from these kind of questions, if you will. We try to, in, but what we try to do is publishing analysis that contributes to a more informed debate. Say, you know, say the English newspapers report, oh my God, when we have TTIP, the American companies will come in and take over our healthcare. Well, then a German Marshall Fund paper ideally would say, um, well, it's a little more complex than this. And this, these are the actual facts uh, that are being negotiated. So. Other questions or comments? So then a follow-up from my side. Um, of course, we try to explain things. There's one. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Also a master's student here. Speak um, up, please. Close. Um, I was wondering if your organization reacted to the recent release of the report made by the USNAID on um, torture by the CIA. CIA? Torture report. 
Uh, we heard about it or whether we... How you reacted responded. to it and if anything was done or, I mean, if you cooperated to do anything towards this. That was actually what I thought about, not as a particular example, but if there are a lot of, let's call it hot potatoes, mm. is it something that you would rather focus on because this is what everyone would like to hear if one visits a website of a transatlantic organization, then you want to see what is their opinion or their explanation, or is the idea, and I think this is also going in the similar direction as the previous question, trying to deliver glue that holds the transatlantic relations together? A little bit of both, but not, re <laughs> not really. Um, I mean, when such a, re we have no, I mean, first of all, we don't, as the German Marshall Fund, we don't have an official opinion, right? We are an NGO. We have people who write, we have people who give interviews, we have people who get invited to, uh, for testimony in front of Congress or Bundestag or wherever to talk about the area of their substance. We are free to do that. We always have a disclaimer. This is the personal view of the author. This is not the, the opinion of the German Marshall Fund. So I, as Heike McCarran, can, can go on television and say, pretty much anything I want, with the exception that it shouldn't be anti. We have a policy, I think it's even written down somewhere, that we are free to say whatever we want, but we are not free to utter prejudice. We are not free to utter um, things like broad statements, oh, you know, as everybody knows, the Americans are really stupid because many of them don't even have a high school degree. This would not be an informed opinion. This would be a prejudice. I'm making this up now. And this goes bo both ways. Same about Germans. But this is really the only limitation that we have. To come back to the... Um, and I think, I don't know what you guys think, but I think that's a, that's a pretty good policy. And pragmatic, I know the Germans will say, but where is the line, where do you draw the line, and what, how, what's the exact definition of all that? We don't have an exact definition of that. I think our board trusts itself so much as to when we, 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 we understand prejudice when we see or read or hear it. Leave it at that. But to come back to this question about the CIA torture report, we don't... We don't comment on that. I mean, this is a, um, something that comes out, and maybe I get invited to give an interview. I haven't yet, but maybe other of my colleagues, I don't know. And then I would try to give a differentiated opinion on, based on the knowledge that I have, which is very limited. I haven't read the report yet. Um, I don't know if it's been fully pu published even. Um, so I would be very careful with my words, but not because I shy away from a hot potato, but just simply because I feel I don't know enough to make a broad, I'm not, I'm not, we're not so interested in producing headlines or strong statements about these things if we feel we, we don't know enough. Where's the microphone? More questions, comments? Yes, here's one. Nick. Hi, I'm Nick. From, I'm an uh, American student studying linguistics and environmental studies, and this is a slightly tangential question, but um, I was wondering if you see any future in transatlantic environmental protection and whether the GMF does any, has any programs in that area. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, Yes, we, we do, although we have changed it many times. When I came to GMF in, again, sort of, I think it's, it's, for me it's a, it's a good question because it, I can show you how an organization like ours develops. When I joined GMF we had a, in, in the 90s, we had a strong program was called environment, the environment. And we sent uh, uh, Europeans to the United States to look at the national parks. We sent Americans over here that uh, met with Germans or other Europeans who were engaged in environmental protection. You know, what, what, what were the issues of the day, the Waldsterben and things like that. Um, we had, so. Then for... Then, oh, there were even official government consultations on environment. I remember, you know, between Germany and the United States and Europe and the United States, uh, between the E, what's it, the EPA, 
uh, in Washington and the German equivalents and European. There was lots of stuff going on and both sides were very interested in making progress. That died down when the environmental discussion changed to a climate change discussion. And that's when, and again, I'm not running this program, I'm not the expert, I just observed what happened. The climate negotiate, we, we had a climate program for a while, and we devised programs, and we sent, we, we did track two diplomacy by sending European climate experts, and even, I think we even had the negotiators, we brought them to the United States, and vice versa, and this and that, and the other thing, we did that for a while, then we felt, well, the political, division is so deep that we cannot do much. We're wasting our money. We won't change opinion, we won't change, we won't change the debate, so we gave up on that. Then we observed there's another shift, and there was now the climate change discussion is turning into an energy discussion. All of a sudden, energy was on the table. So now we have an energy program, but that is even not so. We will probably recreate a climate program and we see you know, that the Obama administration is serious about you know, moving this forward and negotiating. So again, you know, we can contribute, I hope, a little bit to moving these debates forward, but we cannot move them as such if the policymakers on both sides don't agree on anything or internationally. But traditionally, we have, a, we, have a, we have worked a lot on the environment. Also in, East, in Eastern Europe, we had something called the Envi Environmental Partnership in Eastern Europe. So I'm, I'm proud that we have a strong track record, but uh, it's not changed the world. Let me put it that way. Thank you. Other questions? You mentioned the policy entrepreneur spirit that plays an important role in the work of GMF. If one of these future leaders in the field would come up with an idea and bring their money or bring their affiliation with another institution, is GMF joining forces and creating synergies? Or is it like Bertelsmann, this is what we do and it's exclusive and it has to be invented by Bertelsmann? So we have very different types of NGOs. That's why I'm trying to yeah. compare the two extremes. I have to smile when you say Bertelsmann, um, but I won't comment any further. But uh, we used to be a classical American grant, organi grant making organization. So the answer, my answer 10 years ago would have been yes. Come to us, our philosophy is um, let many flowers bloom. You know, we are, we are making grants, we are reviewing proposals, we are good proposals we're happy to fund or advise you on forming partnerships and all that. We have changed. Um, we have become more operational. Part of it was, uh, I think, a natural development for an organization. You know, I started as GM, at GMF as a program officer. Program officer is a great job, I can tell you. It's not an easy job, but it's a great job. Because people come to you with their ideas, you review them, you talk to them, but you're not the one who has to implement them, <laughs> you know, but you're the one who criticizes them after them, although I think of our criticism as, as constructive criticism. Um, and plus, you're extremely popular. Leave it at that. After 30 years of doing that, and really you get to know the field extremely well, you get to know the players, you get to know the product, our board says and said, well, maybe we should try to do it ourselves, maybe we have learned something, and maybe we want to, we want to prove ourselves that we know our field, so we shifted. So the short answer, that was a very long answer to a short question, the short, quest, the short answer right now is no, one cannot come to us with projects, um, and um, we fund them. A few exceptions, but the general answer is, is no. Yeah. It doesn't make us like Battlesman, though. I want to, for the record. <laughs> yeah, we might invite some. I mean, from because we do, we do, we still have a large part, and maybe that leads too far, I don't know how much time we have. We do have a large part of the organization that still makes these types of grants, but we do not make them in Western Europe. We make them in the Black Sea region, we make them in Turkey, we even make them in Ukraine and Russia in the Balkans region, where we feel, you know, this sort of tiny civil society support 
makes, a makes still a difference. Do you have an advice for the next? Oh, here's a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Victoria. Thanks for your time um, for coming here. Do you listen to me? Yes, I, okay. and I can even understand you. Yeah. <laughs> and my question is because when I saw your CV, I was really impressed. And my question is that I don't know if to, to be a woman and have such a good position, it's more difficult than be a man in this world. So. It's related that maybe for you was hard or it was the same. I don't know if you understand mm. the point. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a very legitimate question. I have no problem answering it. My, my perception, and this is really talking from personal experience, was and still is that the United States and Germany are very different uh, in that regard. Um, Yesterday, I was at an event actually also about leadership development and HR and so forth. That, there was a guy from a very big German bank who talked about a German, one of the large, managing their HR globally, talking about you know, how hard it is that for a German bank, to, and the German banking sector, probably like other banks, is very male, still very male, top down, you know, no, no women, and women who were on the board or in the executive management didn't last very long and all that. How hard it is to shift cultures. When I look at German foundations, foreign policy, uh, think tanks, organizations, I also see that the top management is male and it's, it's hard. In the United States, I think it's different. I think it has, I mean, I can just, again, judge from my own development, we have, an, we have a, uh, a president that's female, we have at least half of the board that's female, and um, I do think that the United States is further advanced, and I also think, get, could come back to my personal history, I'm not sure I would have been given the same chance in a German organization that I was given was, without, there was never any question about it um, by, by the management about me being a woman or not having a PhD and all these things. So, that, I mean, that's, a, I, I don't want to si sound like a, um, I don't know, like naive here, but I was given this famous chance that, you know, if you prove yourself, you can make it and no further questions asked. What's the balance at the moment in the office? How many male and female? Um, Roughly. Yeah, we have more. We are more men, uh, women than men in the office. Yeah. That's what I thought. And uh, the the sort of senior, not, not in age also, but also in seniority in terms of position, it's it's a women's shop. <laughs> here we go. So do you have an advice for everyone who comes here to work hard and with not the appropriate support that NGOs could offer for the next step if people want to work in a similar field? Um, from where I see, you know, I have, we have many interns Ourselves, and I often get these questions from, from young people. And I, I, have, I have a hard time finding a good response and giving some constructive advice like do this or do that. Because I feel the world has changed so much. I'm 55 years old now. When I, when I uh, was at your age, I would never have dreamt of taking an unpaid internship. I mean, because, you know, <laughs> I needed the money, I couldn't afford it, plus there were jobs out there, and the world has really changed. Now I see young people who have excellent degrees, have done many things, speak three languages, people like you, who come to me and say, you know, what, what, how can I get into this field? And I don't have an answer, because even in our own institution, 
you know, things have changed. I'm not sure I would get the same job now. I'm the only one. Um, and now uh, young people, we have young people who have much, many more qualifications than I have and who are in lower positions because the comp it's a very narrow field and the competition is very strong. That's all not, you know, please don't go home now and think, you know, it's impossible. It is still possible, but it's become harder. Um, I don't know if that's, that's not a good answer, but <laughs> it's the best I can answer. give. Yeah. Mm. So I think we have time for one more, if there is one. Oh, come on, one more. <laughs> Great opportunity. Oh. <laughs> it's too burdensome too, to be the last uh, speaker. Too depressive what I said. Huh? <laughs> too depressed. <so. laughs> All right, then, if there is no one, then thank you very much for coming and for uh, sharing your expertise and your thoughts with us. This, as I mentioned earlier, is the beginning of something that we will continue in a sort of loose form to bring people here either who you think we should bring or that you don't know that they exist because it's kind of unfair to make you do wishes before Christmas and after. And most of us come just for a short time and don't really fully understand what the rich and diverse scene in that field in Berlin is like. So thank you very much for coming so shortly before Christmas. I know it's not the best time of the year to find time, but I also thought it would be a great opportunity to introduce the new ICD and maybe we can do something in the future in this institution or whatever will come up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.